You may be seated. Thank you, Dwayne. Don't our young people just make you proud to watch the way that they, they've grown and the way that they've matured and they, they've stepped up and, and uh, put themselves at, at risk. I, I remember one of the, the first uh, young uh, people's group that I, I worked with as, as a preacher. We, I, I called a Sunday afternoon class for, for boys, uh, a, a Timothy class back then, and, and one, one, of the, one of the wonderful deacons in, uh, in Ranger, Texas, uh, had had such a remarkable uh, son, and and he was uh, in like the second or third grade, and he wanted to be in there with us. and And uh, the first time he he led a song, I I told him, you know, it it it's it's so it's so refreshing to to see that happen, and the willingness, and and uh, uh, th- they're not as intimidated or embarrassed by mistakes. And he said, I don't ever make one. <laughs> I lo- I loved it. I loved it, and uh, take your Bibles tonight, again tonight, T- just take your Bibles. We're, we're going to be just using the Bible uh, in our, our studies back since uh, uh, the, the middle of May, uh, and even before, actually, the, the end of April. We've been looking at how to study the Bible, how to understand uh, what God has said, and, and, and I will be saying it every time we assemble, and especially talking about this subject. Read, 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 read. Read the Bible. Read it. Uh, read, read the Bible books. Uh, and, uh, and, and read, e- even in some of those more difficult uh, uh, places in the Old Testament where there's lots of names, the, those, those names are not insignificant. Uh, that that is, is a marvelous account where, where God gives us record of, of individual people and tells us about genealogies of of families that were faithful to him for, for generation after generation, and God continued the promise through them. That, it, it's powerful to see that. Uh, and uh, so read it, read it, read it. Read it as though uh, it was God's personal letter to you, each one of those books. And, and it is. It, it's God's written word to us today. And, and become familiar with it. And, and then go. And, and, and read it looking to understand and, and to see exactly what it is that God's talking about there. Uh, and if you're having trouble uh, understanding a passage, then, then back out away from it and, and, and read all of, of the book that you find it in. Uh, and maybe even read it several times and, and then come back after you get a, a, a picture, a mental picture of, of what's going on there. Uh, we're we're going to look at, at uh, give, see an example tonight of, of how to to actually understand uh, what God is talking about, because there is misunderstanding out there. I don't believe, I I honestly don't believe that most misunderstanding of of the Word of God uh, is intentional. Uh, I I think it's it's often quite uh, accidental, or maybe because people are are not as as keen to look and to study and, and ask questions and challenge their own thinking. Sometimes I think it's because of laziness uh, and but I, I, I honestly don't believe that, that most uh, misunderstanding of the Scripture is, uh, is because uh, people are set to misunderstand it. Uh, I've told you about uh, a Baptist preacher that I met uh, back in, in 1974. I was uh, managing a funeral home in Kentucky and, and, and preaching for two different places uh, every Sunday because of the difference, uh, the timeline that was there allowed uh, us to do that, and there was a, a smaller congregation a little bit north, about 45 miles, uh, that needed a preacher, and, and they just begged, said, please, and so they changed their class time and worship time to an hour earlier. They were already an hour earlier than we were, but they moved it even an hour earlier than that so that uh, I could drive up and teach class and then preach and, and then uh, be able to drive down uh, to Clarkson where we uh, were, were ministering there. Um, and, and uh, uh, this, this Baptist preacher uh, had become a brother in Christ. He had, he had become a brother in Christ uh, because uh, he was just reading, reading. Uh, and he, he, he thought that night on Sunday night, and I've got this Sunday night ha-has or ha-has or whatever after I've preached twice and, and, and uh, uh, emptied myself. And, 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 and that man, Ralph Yarborough was his name, uh, I, I was intrigued because the, the preacher from down in Alabama that had, had uh, 
uh, converted him, he called me and he said he needs to spend some time with, with good gospel preachers. Now, I don't know why he called me, uh, but he said he just needs to spend some time. Uh, and, and, and he said, so can you host him for a week or two? And I said, well, sure. You know, I don't mind doing that. And he said, y'all can spend your time together in, uh, in studying and in, in talking. And, uh, and uh, he said, then maybe your dad will do it. And then maybe your brothers will do it. And, and so he kind of booked us up for two months that way. And, and, uh, uh, but, but this man had, uh, had finished preaching on a Sunday night, and when they finally went to bed, they had little reading lights. His wife had a reading light, and he had one. And, and he lays there in bed, and he turns his reading light on, and she rolls over and goes to sleep, and he decides he's going to read Luke and Acts. And so he reads through the Gospel of Luke, and then Acts is, 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 the, uh, is the sister book to that, uh, because it's also God used Luke to write that, uh, and uh, it's a continuation. And, and so it's just a natural thing. And, and he has finished Luke, and it's fresh in his memory when he turns over to Acts and he starts reading. And, and when he got to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, when it said, Repent, when God through Peter said, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, it clicked. And he said, Now, wait a minute, I just read about remission of sins back over in, in Luke. And so he turns back over to Luke chapter 24, and, and he reads where Jesus said uh, that you will be my witnesses in, in Jerusalem, and, and you'll preach uh, repentance and remission of sins. And he's going, wait a minute. So then he turns over to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, and he reads that again, and it says, repent and be ba baptized, repentance and remission of sins in Acts 2, 38. And and it's connected to baptism. And he wakes his wife up. And he says, honey, listen to this. Listen, listen to what it's saying. He had, been, he had been a Baptist preacher for 25 years. He had served as president for the Southern Baptist Association. They already had their retirement home over in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And they were able to go over and spend their vacation time over there if they wanted to, to get accustomed to to the house that was going to become their home in retirement. And, and it, was, it was a retirement gift. And, and uh, uh, upon retirement, the, the deed would be signed over. And, and so he reads that to her, and she says, okay. And he says, no, did you hear, did you hear what? Th this is not Church of Christ doctrine. This is what the Bible says. And she said, okay. And she rolled over and went, to, went back to sleep. And he woke up, and he says, no. No, listen to this. He said, this is just the Bible. And she said, okay, we'll talk about it tomorrow. And he couldn't go back to sleep. He got up and he started running references and, and got his concordance out. And, and, and he's studying. And then he remembers this preacher that had come and spoken to, to a ministerial alliance meeting uh, and said, if you ever need me for anything, call me any hour of the day or the night. And so they, he called him. Like at 2 or 3 in the morning. And he said, I need you. And he said, well, put coffee on. And he said, I'll be there in about two or three hours that it would take him to drive there. And he went there and they studied for two days and he baptized him into Christ. And his wife said, have you lost your mind? What in the world are you thinking? He says, this is what God says. And she says, I know, but we have a retirement home. It's going to be ours in, in a year and a half. And, and he said, but this is what the Bible says. And she said, they're going to fire you. He says, they love me. I've been president of the association. They, they love me. And she said, please don't do what I know you're going to do. And he said, it's okay because it's the Bible. And so he preached Sunday morning exactly what he had, had discovered from the Scripture. And they met with him right after service. They said, we'll give you Sunday night to retract that. And so they had a bigger attendance on Sunday night than they had on Sunday morning. And he didn't retract it. He said, this is what the Bible says. And they said, you have a week to be out of the house. And it, they, they voided everything. And he said, she's in shock. I think I could understand the shock. Because that, that is the catching point for a lot of people. They, they, they stop because it goes against what they have, have always thought. And, or maybe it, it, wh where, they, where they are, or relationships, or money is involved 
He was able to, to win his wife. And he baptized her himself. And he says, I pray to God every minute of every day that I'll be able to reach my children that I have misled. Mm. I've lost track with him over time. That was a long time ago. So let's listen to what God has to say tonight and then ask ourselves, what, what is he really talking about here? In Jesus' prayer, Jesus' prayer, John chapter 17, verses 11 and 12. Verses 11 and 12. Gary, I got to thinking about this this morning and talking to you before class. Gary, Gary did an impromptu class this morning. He did a remarkable job. Did a remarkable job. But we were in the office, and, and he was saying, I'll do it. And I said, I can do it. I've got, you know, this lesson that I'm gonna, it's going to be several weeks before I deliver it. And, and, and he said, no, let's not mess that up. And, and, and so I said, okay. And, but it, it never left my I had been obsessed with this. And so I thought, okay, you know. Maybe that was the way that, that God was wanting me to, to do this now. And so here it is. Beginning in verse 11, John chapter 17 and verse 11. He said, I'm no longer in the world. Jesus talking to his father and the apostles listening. I'm no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. I come to you, Holy Father. You, don't you love the way Jesus has such confidence in his father and in everything that's happening? He is still in the world. He is still in the world. He hasn't died yet. He still has, he still has Gethsemane tonight. The, the night that he's praying this, he still has Gethsemane. But he is able to say through faith in God, through faith in his Father, he committed himself to the one who judged righteously, and he knew, as we talked about it this morning, he says, Lo, I come to do thy will. In the volume or in the scroll of the book or in the volume of the book, it is written of me. Jesus said, I have come to do everything you have said that we have said about me and about my coming. That's exactly what he did. And so he was able to express confidence that was still out there, something that he... That's what he wants for us. That's why when we're in 1 John, and, and John keeps talking about for we, there's the things that we can know that we can actually know right now, absolutely, positively, that we can know. Not arrogance. If it's arrogance, it's wrong. But confidence, confidence, faith in God is, 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 is powerful. And Jesus has that right here. He said, I am no longer in the world. You see, because he was able to look beyond what was there. Isn't that what Hebrews chapter 12 tells us? Who for the joy that was set before him, where, where is that joy? It's on the other side of the cross. The joy that was set before him, he was able to endure the cross. He despised the shame, and he is now set down at the right hand of, of the Father. That, that's that's um, amazing. Grab that. Grab that tonight. Get, get that part tonight. But before we go in, into what I'm, I'm, we're really going to talk about, but grab that. Jesus was still in the world. He still had not died. He, he, had, he had not gone to the cross. He had not been buried and raised from the dead. But he says, I'm no longer in the world because he knew, just as you can know and just as I know, I know, I know where I'm going to be when I die. I know where I'm going to be when this life is over. There is not a doubt in my mind that I will be forever with the Lord. That is not arrogance. I, I tremble when I say that because I don't want anyone to misunderstand that. And, and there have been those that have. And maybe it's sometimes the way I say it, and, and I try not to say it. In a, but listen to what he says. I'm no longer in the world, yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, Keep them in your name. That's what we're talking about tonight. Keep them in your name. The name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. And I guarded them, and not one of them perished but the son of perdition, so that the Scripture would be fulfilled. Keep them in your name. While I was with them, I kept them in the name. 
the name that you gave me. And, and I, I protected them. What is he talking about? What does it mean whenever he says, keep them in thy name? What does it mean whenever he says, I have kept them by the power of your name? Some translations use that, that language. I have I've protected them. I have, some translations will say, I've guarded them. And not a one of them was lost except the one, the son of perdition that the Scripture would be fulfilled. Is he talking about what we in America so often focus on? Upon the flesh and blood, the physical. We don't want to suffer. Americans spend more on pain remedies than all other countries combined. Because we don't want to hurt. At the same time, we want to prolong life. We want to just keep living. I was thinking about that the other day, and I even put a note down. I had to go back and refresh my memory what that note was for uh, about this lesson. Can, can, can you imagine Methuselah? You know, I'm thankful to God, and I give God praise. I, I am thankful that God has not only let me see my children, but let me see my children's children. But you know what? I'd like to see their children. And more than just a little bit, James, I'd like to see their children. Did you know that Methuselah was able to see his great times 20? At the least, his great-grandchildren, the great times 20. Have I been hanging around you too much? My voice is starting to break tonight. <laughs> Sounded like a teenager. That's the closest I've been to a teenager, Dwayne, in a long time. We don't want to suffer. We don't want to hurt. And, and so when we hear passages like this, we, we, we chalk them up. We, we, they, they make little uh, posters out of them, and, and, and we put them up, and, and people talk about them, and, 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 they, and they, they say, name it and claim it. And, 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 uh, uh, is, is he talking about flesh and blood? Is he talking about physical protection here? Well, let's review a couple of historical facts. This, uh, one, we'll begin with, one, we're going to begin with a, the with a Bible fact, but then we're, we're going to, to move into, into history because the Bible doesn't tell us everything about all these people. Jesus is praying uh, specifically here about the apostles. Keep them by the power of your name. James is killed by the sword at the authority of Herod. The Apostle James, there in the city of Jerusalem. And the whole church mourns. Peter's in prison. He intends to kill prison, uh, uh, Peter, but, but God sends an angel to, to free him. And, and, and the church is, is praying. They're meeting at Mary's house, and, and they're praying. And, and, and Peter finds himself uh, out. He, he thinks he's in a dream, but he finds himself out on the street because God has delivered him. But he didn't deliver James. I interesting. Interesting thought. We'll pursue that later, not tonight. But Peter finds him, so, so he goes to where he knows the Christians. He knows his brothers are going to be meeting and praying. And he goes there, and you remember what happens. He, he knocks on the door, and, and a little girl leaves the, the, the prayer meeting, and, and she comes through the door, and, and she sees it as Peter. Uh, I don't know if she opened a little hole there, or she's looking through the peephole or what, and she sees it as Peter, and she runs back. She doesn't let him in. She runs back, and she tells everybody it's Peter, and, and they start saying what? He said, they're no different than we are today. They start saying, well, it's probably a spirit or, or a ghost. Or, you know, maybe they've already killed him. And so, and so that's what we're, we're seeing. And, and, but he kept knocking, and, and then they go. And, and, it's, and it's really him. And, and they're amazed. I mean, they're, they're amazed. They're excited, and they're rejoicing, but they're amazed. They're, they're praying, but they're, they're not expecting that to happen. All right, let's look at this list. James was killed by the sword. We know that. Acts chapter 12 tells us about it. Peter was crucified in, in uh, Rome. Tradition tells us that, that when they were ready to crucify Peter, he, 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 he told the, the executioners, he said, I'm, I'm not worthy to be crucified like Jesus on a cross. 
crucify me upside down. And, and tradition tells us that they did. They crucified him upside down. They thought uh, evidently that that was a novel thing. Andrew, Peter's brother, was crucified. Matthew was killed by a sword in Ethiopia. Thomas was killed by spears in India. James Alpheus was, was thrown from the top of the temple. It didn't kill him. So they stoned him. That didn't kill him. And so they beat him to death with clubs. Protect them by thy name? Is, 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 that, is he talking about physical protection here? Is he talking about sparing people from pain? Let's continue. Thaddeus, or Jude, was killed in Iran. Bartholomew was flayed to death by a whip in Armenia. Philip was crucified. Matthias, that took Judas' place, was stoned. And they didn't kill him, so they beheaded him. We're going to look at some others that are closely connected. Jude, the brother of Jesus, who wrote the book of Jude for us, was killed by arrows. Barnabas was stoned. Paul was beheaded. Mark was drugged to death behind horses in the streets of Alexandria, Egypt. Around and around and around through the streets until finally he died. Luke was hanged in Greece. And of all of the apostles and those close to them, the leaders in the early church, only John, only John died a natural death. And they tried to kill him. They tried to kill him. They boiled him alive in oil. And he survived. And so they left him alone. And later, probably not from the old, but later he dies a natural death. Ask yourself, are we talking about the protection from death? Are we talking about the protection from pain, from suffering? Are we talking about the, the protection that, that we often, and I'm not saying that, that you, you, you shouldn't, uh, I, I'm not saying that you shouldn't try to, to be relieved of, of pain. I, I don't want to hurt. My threshold of pain is a sneeze. Be, beyond that, I, I'm looking for ways out. Well, what have we said about studying? What have we said about studying? The text. Look at the text. And then what? What's next? Help me out, men. The context. See where it is. See where it is. Read the verses before it and after it. And then if you still don't have it, read the chapter, the whole chapter. Uh, and if you still don't, don't understand it, read the chapters on each side and just keep expanding your reading and your searching. And, and sometimes you have to, have to actually go to different books. But every time the Bible uses, every time God uses the same word, it doesn't always mean the same thing. So we even have to be careful there that we not put things together that God does not intend to be together. So let's let God put it together. Just two verses later, listen to what he's saying in verse 15. Jesus' prayer in verse 15, John 17. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. That's it. See, see that, that's, that's the message. That, that, that's not the, the message that uh, the American church wants to hear today. That's, that's not the, the cultural answer that people want to hear. Because we want to hear health and extension of life and freedom from pain and, and suffering and God taking away all of our problems. And He never says He will take away all of our problems in this life. He says He'll be with us. He'll be with us. He makes that promise to the children of Israel and the old. He says, when, when you walk through the fire, I'll be with you. When you cross through the flood, the streams, I'll, I'll, I'll be with you. He's saying, I will be with you. And one of, I believe one of the most significant verses that, that it would be, it'd be easy to miss it because it's in Hebrews 13. And, and sometimes we get tired before we get to chapter 13. In verse 5 where God says, I will never leave you. I will never send you away. That's what it actually means when it, when it says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. It says, I'll never leave you, I'll never send you away. I'm not going to walk away, 
I'm not going to send you away. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man will do to me. So listen to what God is saying. John 17 in verse 15, keep them from the evil one. And anytime it's, it's talking about keep them from evil, the, the implication is there. And, and many translators will, will tell you that it, that it, it also it, it really means keep them from the evil one, the one who is behind all of the evil, which is Satan. And Satan uses every tactic he can. Sounds a whole lot like Jesus' prayer in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13. You remember uh, what, what we often call the Lord's Prayer. Now, tonight we're studying about the, out of the Lord's Prayer in John chapter 17. Uh, Matthew chapter 6 is the model prayer. It, it's, it's the structure, it's the skeleton of, of, of what God expects in our, our communication with Him and what He wants our hearts to, to think about. Give us this day our daily bread. We, we may think, do you remember uh, that, that movie that James Stewart was in, uh, Shenandoah? You remember that one of the one of the great movies. If if you haven't watched it, you know check it check it out and and, and watch it or, or or buy it. You ought to watch it more than once because it's it's a good family movie. Well, no, you're going to come back and say no, it's not because people get killed, but 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 it, it you know it's it's a, a a powerful movie, and uh, and and James Stewart w- was not w- was not as strong a believer, maybe not even a believer at all, like his wife who had, who had already died and and was buried there and, and uh, on their on their farm. Uh, in Virginia, and and uh, he would sit down, and, and 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 everybody would stop, and they would pray for their meal. All the this big giant family sitting there together, and and he would he would say, uh, we 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 cleared the land, uh, we plowed the land, we we planted the crops, we've harvested the crops, we we've, we've cooked what we've harvested, uh, and and so we've we've done it all ourselves. But I suppose we need to say thank you anyway. That that's probably an American prayer. You know, because we, we, we think so much of ourselves. And, and Jesus' prayer, his model prayer, in Matthew chapter 6, says, lead us not into temptation, but do what? Deliver us from evil. Quite literally, deliver us from the evil one. The evil one is real. It's not just evil as a concept is real. The evil one is real. And, and so he, there, there it is. Deliver us from the evil one. Keep us alive or keep us saved? The answer is keep us saved. Keep us saved. I mean, life is not going to mean anything. It really will mean nothing when it's over if you're not saved. And, and, and however selfish or, 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 or just into himself, self-centered uh, the, the rich man was in, in the rich man and Lazarus in, in Luke chapter 19. When, when the rich man has an opportunity to speak through Father Abraham, when he has an opportunity to speak to God, two things. One, he says, have Lazarus dip his finger in water. Just one drop of water. I'm in torment and flames. And, and, and he's told that, that cannot happen. And then he said, then, number two, send him back because I've got five brothers and they're headed straight here. They're right behind me. Their life, their choices, their, 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 their cho- everything about them. They're, they're, we're, we're, we're tracking together. They're, they're going to be here. And, and warn them, tell them. If you have relatives that have passed on and have not been faithful to God, you, you hear, hear their cry. They're saying, don't come here. What, whatever you've got to do, don't come here. Don't come here. Hear what they're saying. Same language in 1 Peter chapter 1. Listen, beginning in verse 3 down through verse 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. And here's the word, reserved in heaven for you. That's that same word that that Jesus says, keep them by the power of your name. Keep, keep. He says, 
And God says, I want you to know that there's a place in heaven that is reserved for you. It's reserved for you. And, and continue in the very, the very language. Not, we don't need the punctuation marks to, to understand what God has said. Undefiled and will not fade away. Reserved in heaven for you. You who are protected. There it is again. Twice God uses that word. You are kept. You are kept by God. Not physically. He's not saying, I'm going to take away your pain. I'm going to cure all of your illnesses. Nothing wrong with praying about that. The, the sick are mentioned in, in, in the letters. God inspired the Apostle Paul to write about some sick people. So surely, surely God understands that, that we're flesh. And He knows about our suffering. He, and Jesus came and He, he endured our, the same suffering that we face. But God says, I've kept a place for you. And I tell you, when God keeps a place, it's kept. It's kept. And He wants to keep us too. Keep us for the place. Keep the place for us and keep us for it. He has reserved the place for, for us and He's reserved us for that place. God will save us, is what He is saying. Who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed at that last time. Drop down a few verses. Same principle involved here as in John chapter 17 when God when we're looking at text and context what is the context what do we learn in the context in verse 9 obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your soul see that's what he's talking about he, he's not talking about uh, that you'll never be tempted he, he's not saying that you'll never hurt that you'll never suffer and that you won't even die he, he's not saying those things He's saying, I will save you. One other passage tonight, and then the lesson is yours. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Preachers, I can talk about preachers since I are one. If you're not one, be careful. Be careful how you talk about them. Preachers make mistakes. I blame preachers for a lot of things. I blame me for a lot of things. But listen to what God is saying here. In verse 28. I mean, here's another one of those placard verses. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. People say that in bad times. And they say, well, God's going to turn all this around. You know, I, I've lost my home, I lost my job, uh, and, and uh, you know, it, everything is, is just falling apart. But I, I, know, I know that it's all going to come back together because God makes this promise, because I know that all, all things work together for the good uh, of those who are the called of God according to His purpose. And church, that may or that may not happen, but that is not what God sa is saying here. It is not what God is saying here. It'd be nice if it was. In this life, it'd be nice if it was. But that's not what it's saying here. What it's talking about, the context, Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, God makes a sandwich out of this. And so we ought to be able to understand it. I mean, we're holding the bread on, on the bread, the Word of God. We're holding it on each side of verse 28. In verse 1, God says, There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. What is He saying? He's saying, I'm going to save you if you'll let me. I'm going to save you if you want to be saved. And, I mean, if you're serious about it, and you're want, and you, I'm going to save you. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Being in Christ. Christ. He says, I'm going to save you. What does he say at the end of, of, of the book? Let's begin in verse uh, 31. And what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Or who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? And we, people get excited. You know, they read 28 and then verse 31, and, and they're saying, see, God's going to give me everything. Everything, freely give me all things, and, but read on. Who will bring any charge against God's elect? That's what he's talking about. Who will bring any charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, oh, here, listen, listen to what he's saying. And then, then think about Jesus' prayer hey, whenever, whenever He says, Keep them by the power of Your name. While I was with them, I kept them through the power of Your name. The name that You gave me, I protected them, I guarded them. Listen now to what He says. 
Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, you mean Christians are going to have troubles? Or distress? It gets a little bit, God's ramping it up here. Or persecution? Or famine? That means there's nothing to eat. Or nakedness? That means you've lost everything. You've lost everything. You don't even have a rag to cover yourself with. Or peril? Now your life's in danger. Or sword? Uh, even worse than just danger now. Just as it is written, for your sake, we are put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep uh, for the slaughter. For your sake. For your sake. For your name. But in all these things, we are overwhelmingly conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God says there's nothing out there in this world or even in the unseen world that's big enough, mean enough, strong enough, ugly enough to, to separate you from God. So what is he saying? The first of Romans chapter 8, he says, I will, I will save you. There is no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. In Christ, that's important because it's relationship. And, and you can either be in Christ or out of Christ. And that's up to you. It's not, it's, it's not a choice that God makes about that because God wants all of us in Christ. He is patient to this very hour, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's His will. And He tells us that we should pray that all men come to a knowledge of the truth and are saved. That's what God wants. Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners. That's what God wants. And He'll do that for you. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And then at the end, He says, there's nothing that can separate you from God. He says, first and end of chapter 8, I'll save you. I want you to know that above everything else. I will save you. I want to save you. But not only do I want to save you, I will save you. Not just that I want to want to save you. That's kind of where we are sometimes. I want to want to be saved. I, I, you know, on, on, on good days, I, I want to be saved. Uh, but on, on other days, I may say, well, I would really like to think that I would want to be saved. No, you know, God is saying, not only do I, do I want it, I will do it. He says, I will save you. At the end of the chapter, he says, we're more than conquerors. He said, there's nothing that can separate you from that. God will save you. And so what he's talking about in the middle? He's talking about salvation. Verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good. What's the ultimate good for me? What is the greatest good that could ever happen to me? Be saved. Be saved. Not be rich. Not be smart. Not be handsome. Not be the strongest guy in the room. I'm already all, no, you, you know better than that. You were already thinking that. You are already thinking that, so I had to, I had to say it for you. What, what, what's really, what really is it that I want? Well, if I, if I want what God wants, God wants to save me. And so he says, there, he said, all things work together for good. It don't make any difference if you're persecuted or if you're killed or, 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 or you're in distress or whatever. God can still save you, and he will save you. Maybe not out of that distress. Maybe not from that persecution, but He will save you. All things work together for good to those who love Christ and are the called according to His purpose. The Apostle Paul's life is a perfect example of that. He went through so much. He went through so much. And if he was, if he was reading Romans 8 and verse 28 the way that sometimes people today read, the American church reads Romans 8 and, and 28, uh, he would say, well, you know, it's got to get better. It, it's got to get better. And, and it didn't seem to get much better uh, until they beheaded him. And then it was exactly what he was talking about in Philippians chapter 1. He says, for me, it'd be better to go on and be with the Lord. But for you, it'd be better for me to stay and help you. And it did get good. All things work together for good. Because now he is with the Lord. That's what God's saying. That's what Jesus is saying. I want to save these men. He was able through his influence and his, his power and through the name of God. Satan was only able to get Judas. And it was because Judas, Judas gave his heart to Satan, not to God. And God is not going to overrule your 
will. God is not going to veto your decision. Your will is your will. And when Judas chose to follow Satan instead of follow Jesus, he shut the door. And God respects that. The truth is, it would be better that he never had been born. He made a choice. Tonight you're making choices. I pray that your choice will be to follow God. Whatever you may need tonight, come right now while we stand and sing.